Once you go black, you never go back. Time to brew a chocolate stout. Hey guys, welcome back to Flying Wombat TV, the channel where it's all about making fun and creative styles of beer with science and biotechnology involved. So we are back for another brew day today. Uh, and lately we've been doing a lot of pale ales and lagers, you know, really light, refreshing styles of beer. So we decided to go down to the other end of the spectrum. Uh, it is down under in the middle of winter. So we figured we need something really meaty and hearty, you know, real winter warmer style of beer. And we decided there was nothing better than a chocolate stout. So that's what we're gonna be brewing today. We are gonna release the recipe to you guys so you can give it a crack yourselves. And uh, you know, as always, enjoy, come along for the ride and brew on. Quick run through on the ingredients. Uh, unlike the pale ales and lagers we've been making in the last few brew days, where it's got a lot of different hop complexity and a basic grain bill, this time it's the other way around. So starting with the hops, uh, we're going to be using 20 grams of Northern Brewer, that in Imperial units and that will be there through the video. At the start of the boil for our bittering, we're going to use 50 grams each of Northern Brewer and Fuggles at the uh, 15 minute mark for our flavour additions as well as the, the 15 minute mark our world flock tablets to help with clarity. Next on for the grain bill, we're gonna be using uh, oh, just over eight kilos, I can't remember, we'll put the actual numbers up there, of um, uh, light Munich malt. So that's gonna give the majority of our base malt flavor, you know, the texture, the, the, the touch of sweetness, the maltiness that's common in uh, the dark ales. Uh, about a kilo and a half of big O malt, again, all that up there, uh, which is a uh, husked, um, oat malt. So that's going to help give us that creaminess, the mouthfeel, but because it has the husks, it helps with sparging so it doesn't all get stuck. Uh, now the thing that's going to give us our colour, the black stuff. So this is dark chocolate malt. So that's going to give us our roasty espresso, dark chocolate type uh, flavours and aromas. Next we've got golden naked oats. So similar to the oats over here, except these ones are huskless and they've been slightly caramelised. So it's going to help with that mouthfeel, the silkiness, a little bit of sweetness, a bit of nuttiness going on. And then lastly, for the bulk of our sweetness, we have um, uh, crystal malt, medium crystal malt. So this is gonna be about 4% of the grain bill, uh, about 484 grams or something along those lines. And uh, just, uh, just enough to give us the sweetness without completely overpowering the rest of the grain bill. Now, the two specialty additions or the adjuncts that we're gonna be throwing into this thing. Um, we have got two sets of cacao nibs going on here. So these cacao nibs are going to be used in the actual brew day itself. So we're going to use these kind of like hops towards the end of the boil. And there's 500 grams of cacao nibs here. All of these uh, nibs have been slightly crushed. So uh, you could use like a food processor or something, give it a couple of blends, just crush it a bit finer and then toast it in the oven at 180 degrees Celsius, that in Fahrenheit for about five minutes. We've done that with two different sets of 500 grams of cacao nibs. These ones are just as is, gonna get thrown in, kind of like um, flavoring hops at the end of the boil. I think we'll put these in at about the five minute mark, but I might change my mind. These ones over here are macerating in a bunch of rum. So you can use whatever type of rum that you find preferable. Uh, maybe something a little bit more molassesy and dark, maybe a dark spiced rum. It depends what your preference is. It will slightly impact the, uh, the flavor of the beer, what rum you use. Not a whole lot. What you're really using the rum for is the alcohol because it will act like a solvent, extracting all the different oils and flavors out of the cacao nibs in here. And I prepared this today so that we can use this when we need to put it into the tank uh, towards the end of fermentation. So the earlier you can do this, the better. Um, you know, if you can do this a week, a week and a half in advance, or just do it on the brew day so that it's ready for you when you need to put it into the fermenter tank. The more time it has to interact with the alcohol, the more flavor it's going to extract. Uh, and then lastly, the yeast. Uh, so we are using SO4, uh, Safael SO4 yeast. So it's an English style of yeast, which is great for this style of beer. Uh, it's pretty fast fermenting and it's great at clarifying. All the yeast has a great attenuation and flocculation. So it drops to the bottom of the tank uh, really effectively towards the end of fermentation. And we just got a yeast starter going here. So if you're doing a, um, like a 50 liter batch, that freedom units, then uh, you know use two packets of this stuff or use a yeast starter and uh, let's get into brewing. Okay, if you haven't uh, joined us for our previous videos or you're new to brewing, uh, this step is called grain milling. So it just means all these grains here, just need to throw them into the mill to crush them. Uh, about a one millimeter gap, 1.1 around that range is a, is a good setting to use. Everyone's mill is different though, so you kind of got to play with yours and figure out what's right for you. you plug it in again. <laughs> <laughs> Alright, 
uh, just make sure that when you are doing a bit of a complex grain bill and when you're working with smaller grains or grains with more, uh, more moisture, like especially in dark ales, mix all the grains together with your base malts. All the specialty malts, mix them in with your base malts. It'll make it easier for the grain to actually feed through the mill. If you try to mill specialty grains separately, especially wheat or oat, sometimes they can get stuck in the mill and then it's a real pain in the ass trying to pull this thing apart and trying to fix it. So yeah, just mix it all together and mill them all together. Now we're gonna be mashing in. Uh, again, if you're new to brewing, basically means when you put all those grains that we just milled into your mash tun, uh, where you let it sit for about an hour to an hour and a half, depending on the beer you're making. Our mash temperature is gonna be 67 degrees but our strike temperature of our water is gonna be set a bit higher than that. Ours is set at 71 degrees. Uh, you can figure out what strike temperature you need with a bunch of different uh, calculators. We use Chase the Craft, shout out to Jesse. We'll put a link down there somewhere. But um, basically the reason for that is because as you put the grains in, uh, it's gonna lose a little bit of temperature because the grains are cooler than the liquid. It's gonna cool the liquid down. You get the general idea. So let's start mashing it. And then you will need a uh, mixing paddle or something that can mix. So either a, a mash paddle like this, a, um, a giant spoon, a big spatula, a whisk, whatever you have available, uh, just to make sure that you can mix up all the grains together. As I say in all the videos, uh, this is to prevent dough balls from happening, which is when you get a big clump of grains that stick together, they're wet on the outside and on the inside they're completely dry. So it just ruins your uh, your efficiency. Uh, you get less uh, less alcohol, less beer, less flavour. So just give it all a nice good mix. Oh, that already smells so good. So um, it smells like well, it smells really bready, like like dark bread, like a black bread that you get fresh from the bakery, and a little bit of um, espresso going on. Uh, another little tip is add a little bit of grain, give it a mix, a little bit more grain, give it a mix. Just makes it easier to mash all this stuff in, prevents dough balls, and um, yeah, that's pretty much it. In total, I think we are using, if I'm not mistaken, about 12 kilos of grains today. That in imperial units. Um, and I don't know for certain what alcohol we're going to get out of this. Uh, this recipe is pretty new. We haven't actually done this one before, so if it's an absolute shit show, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> but that's kind of the part of the fun of brewing, is just, you know, playing around with different recipes, different ingredients. Like, we're, we changed a lot of stuff for this one from the last time that I made this, like, a stout. So, um, yeah, I don't know for sure if it's going to taste any good. It might taste like absolute hot garbage, but only one way to find out. But um, yeah, we're aiming for something pretty, you know, pretty boozy. So I'd be happy with like seven, seven and a half percent. And I think uh, based on our ratios, our grains, that's going to get us there. Uh, I forgot to say before with the ingredients was how much water we're using. So for this recipe, 50 litre batch, uh, we're going to be using 30 litres of water in the mash and then 30 litres of sparge water. Sparge water will be set at uh, 78 degrees. If you don't know what sparge water is, uh, we'll explain that in a minute you know, when we get to it. Um, as far as what I'm doing here, I'm just recirculating the water. So our brewing system has a pump so we can recirculate the wort over top of the grain bed. Helps with efficiency, helps with clarity and makes it easier when you're mashing in like this. If you don't have this, don't stress, you really don't need it. Alright, so now we're all mashed in, uh, we just need to put our top filter on, uh, again if you don't have this, don't stress, you don't need it, uh, we have one so we're going to use it, just helps us recirculate the wort more evenly, and uh, come sparging time, whoops, come sparging time it helps us uh, evenly, evenly distribute <laughs> the sparge water. <laughs> Not a blooper, Not a blooper all, all part of the process. Yeah, fully intentional, I meant to drop it like that. <laughs> Well, I haven't stained the, the white jumper yet, so we'll see how long that lasts. <laughs> My guess is like That's the half goal of the day. <laughs> it's gonna be a brown jumper at the end of the day. Yep. <laughs> Shows how dirty you get. Yeah. Right. Once you go black, you never go back. <laughs> <laughs> so will the jumper. <laughs> right. 
Mashing is finished, uh, so I'm gonna leave this at 67 degrees, that in Imperial units for one hour. We'll come back at the end of that, and then we'll get to sparging and then to boiling. So the mash is now finished. Uh, it's ready to start sparging. It's been an hour at 67 degrees. We're gonna raise our uh, grain bed up, let all the liquid drain out, start sparging it, and then we can get into the boil. Yeah, so we've got a little bit of a complex setup going on here to lift our grains out. You can do it manually, uh, just like literally lifting it, but that's a lot of effort and uh, I don't feel like breaking my back today, so I'm gonna use a winch. Once again, as with anything, you don't need it, we have it, we're gonna use it. Nice and easy. Sparging. Uh, if you're new to brewing, this basically means running a bunch of hot liquor, so hot water at 78 degrees Celsius over top of your grain bed to uh, remove and to extract any extra sugars that are stuck inside the grains here. So you run the water through it, gives you a bit of extra beer for your buck basically, improve it on efficiency, and it's at 78 degrees to denature the beta and alpha amylase enzymes that are within here so that it stops breaking down that sugar essentially. So we're gonna start running our hot liquor over top of our grain bed now. And then, um, you know, after the sparge, we can get into the boil. So once the, the water level starts rising, we're gonna start getting a whirlpool going on. The sparge water's now saturated the grains, so we've got this water level rising up here. We wanna keep the flow rate pretty steady, so all the liquid just gradually drains through all the grains. So uh, you can do uh, fly sparging or batch sparging. We can explain the differences in another video if you'd like, but basically with fly sparging, the water just continuously drains through the grain bed. With uh, batch sparging is when you just fill up a whole bunch of uh, hot water, mix it into the grains, drain it out, fill up more hot water, mix it in, drain it out. So they're both of their pros and cons. Uh, if you can do either, whichever is easier for you, go for it. We can fly sparge, so we fly sparge. So we're done sparging. Um, this is what you end up with. It's uh, called spent grains. So if you want to zoom in here and have a look. Uh, I mean, yours are going to look the same as this if you're brewing along with us. Basically, it's the grains after all the sugars and all the major nutrients have been sucked out of it. You can do things with these spent grains. Um, I've seen people make uh, spent grain um, sourdough bread. Uh, I've seen pump some people make pasta out of it. Um, you can make dog biscuits. You can feed it to cattle. Uh, you can do a bunch of stuff with it, so if you're near a farm, you know, maybe go give it to a bunch of cows, they'll love this stuff, it's like candy to them. Same as pigs, um, but, you know, basically this stuff is now rubbish to us, so if you're not going to do anything with it, chuck it out, get ready to boil. Stay on for me, be a good boy. Oh, look how dark it is. That is beautiful, mate. Like a giant. It's starting to look less like an espresso, more like a hot chocolate. Yeah, yeah. All right. Um, so what we just did here is we just added the extra extension tube onto our uh, boiling system. Uh, just to prevent a boil over because, you know, a stout has got a lot of protein, a lot of complex carbohydrates, a lot of lipids, a lot of oils. So. Um, it's very, very prone to making a lot of foam as it gets up to boiling. So to prevent all that foam from spilling everywhere and me having a big mess to clean up, extension tube does the trick. All right, so we're at boiling temperature now. So start of the boil, grab your bittering hops, throw them in. Uh, we have a hop spider to help, you know, with that sort of filtering. If you don't, you can just chuck them straight in. But hops away. There we go. Now at the 45 minute mark, so I'm going to start my timer. In uh, 45 minutes from now, you'll want to um, add your, uh, the rest of your flavor and aroma hops and your uh, two well flocked tablets. See you then. Okay, so 15 minutes left in the boil, add your uh, flavor and aroma hops. As well as your well flocked tablets. Bloop. And now with, uh, we'll wait 10 more minutes. When we've got five minutes left in the boil, we'll add our uh, cacao nibs, our 500 grams of toasted nibs. Um, yep, then flame out and uh, whirlpool 
put it in the fermenter. Alrighty, yeah. so we've got five minutes to go now on the boil. Oh, it smells so good. Don't add tip your, it. Add, Don't your tip it. <laughs> add your add your cacao nibs into the boil with five minutes remaining. <laughs> the hops are propping it up. Might need a bit of persuasion. <laughs> this is the first time we've ever done this. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So if it doesn't work, that's why. <laughs> Looks like it's working. Mix it in. <laughs> All right, five minutes left. Uh, once five minutes hits, flame out, start whirlpooling, start cooling. We don't want the, the idea, well, the logic at least behind adding the cacao at five minutes is so that we do get flavor extraction. I didn't want to add it that much earlier than that because cacao does carry a lot of bitterness. So I didn't want the beer to become too bitter because of how much nibs we're adding so I don't know I'm thinking five minutes might add minimal bitterness but get a big punch of flavor out of it we'll see if I was right or not hey okay, so it's now uh, finished the boiling so turn off your heat your flame whatever you're using to keep your your rolling boil going it's flame out time so turn it all off and time to start whirlpooling so this here is a counterflow chiller so what we're going to do is we're going to pump the liquid up through here into the chiller, out down back into the tank, it'll create a whirlpool. Uh, and uh, cool water is going to be flowing uh, on the around the, the the beer line, basically inside this thing. So that's what that is. Anyway, mm -hmm. whatever chiller you're using, start using it. Bring this down to yeast pitching temperature. Open that up. Open that up. Start the pump. <sighs> Ooh. <laughs> It's a wild boy. Stand back, she's set to blow. <laughs> now, now she's calmed down. Feels all the bubbles caused by pushing the air through. Yeah. Through the pump. I didn't account for that. Oh look, my jumper's still white. <laughs> <laughs> so we're now at yeast pitching temperature. So once your beer is cool, transfer it into your fermenter vessel. Um, and then time to pitch your yeast. Once all your wort is in the fermenter and you're ready to pitch your yeast, uh, grab whatever you're using. So if you're using a culture like this, time to throw it in there. If you're using packets, throw your packets in. If you've done a rehydration, whatever you've done, chuck your yeast into the fermenter, let it start doing its thing. Uh, I thought I'd quickly mention what's going on with this thing here. So this, uh, the rum concoction that I told you to set up earlier, um, this thing we're gonna throw into the fermenter when fermentation is almost complete. So you can either just strain off the liquid and use the concentrated liquid to throw into your fermenter as the flavoring agent, or if you can, you can just throw the entire thing in. Um, for us, we will probably just use the liquid because we don't want to have straining issues coming out of our plumbing on the tank. But if you're like doing a bucket fermentation or something and you can just throw the whole thing in, chuck it all in there. The more in there, the better, you'll get more flavor out of it. But that will be towards the end of fermentation so you don't disrupt the yeast with all the alcohol from that. So now, if you're ready to pitch your yeast, grab it, throw it into the tank, and you're good to go. Now we'll just let these little soldiers do their thing. Uh, and I forgot to say, uh, ferment at um, 19 degrees Celsius. So the yeast we're using is SO4. Uh, so it's fermenting at 19 degrees Celsius is that happy point. Towards the very end of fermentation, bump the temperature up by two degrees for two days, just to get rid of that diacetyl. Um, and then before doing a cold crash, if you have the ability to cold crash. Alrighty. Time to close this off. Okay, so the next time we're gonna see you guys is uh, when we're throwing in the, um, the, uh, the concoction, the maceration with the rum and the cacao nibs. Uh, so that will be, I'm guessing at about one week. I wanna throw that in when our uh, final gravity gets to about maybe 1.02, something around there, to let those flavors marinate with the yeast fermentation a little bit. So uh, we'll see you in about a week, and then we'll throw that stuff in. Jar of dirt. Oh, I got a jar of dirt. <laughs> okay, guys, so it's been a week uh, since uh, we did this brew day, um, and it's time to do a bit of, you know, dry hopping. So these are the uh, cacao nibs that we roasted, we crushed, and that we've been soaking in the uh, rum for the last, you know, week or so. So it's time for this stuff to get into the tank. All right, so there's two ways that you can go about getting your cacao nibs into the tank. 
Uh, if you're using like a bucket fermenter or a fermenter where it doesn't matter if you have to deal with all this debris inside there, you can just go ahead and dump the whole thing in. You will get more chocolatey flavor out of it if the actual nibs are in there as well. Uh, but for us, because we've got, you know, some sophisticated plumbing in there that I'd rather not get all blocked up, I'm just going to filter out all of the, um, uh, all of the liquid and then leave all the debris inside this and, I don't know, maybe use it for a different kind of experiment. But you could also use like a, a brew in a bag sort of thing, like a hop sock or something like that and just throw it into the tank. They're all good options. There's no one that's better than the other. They've all got their pros and cons. For us, we're just going to filter out the liquid and use the liquid as a um, extracted flavor booster to put into the tank. Just use like a, uh, a measuring jug and a sieve. You know, pretty standard household items. Oh my god, that smells so, so good. I do want to smell it. <laughs> <laughs> that smells so good. Oh fuck. That's like, oh, I really hope you guys do actually do this recipe because just if nothing else, just smell what we're smelling right now because yeah. it is just so good. It's like really, really intense Belgian chocolate, like a hot chocolate, like but extra in every way. It's so good. Toblerone galore. Yeah, it is good. It is like a Toblerone, yeah. All right, so just throw it all in, filter out the liquid from the rest of the debris, and then um, toss it into the tank. So it'd be interesting to see how much liquid we actually get out of this, because the cacao nibs will soak up quite a bit of it. So let's see how much we can salvage. Maybe you get a presser. Yeah, you could use a press. I don't want to crush the cacao too much, and I don't want any powderiness to get yeah. into the beer. So I don't want to be too rough with it, but let's see how that goes. We'll let that drain for a couple minutes. And once that's done, we'll take a final reading on how much liquid we actually got out of it. We'll throw that into the tank. And the reason why you do want to know how much liquid you're actually getting out of this, if you're using this method, is because that's how you're going to calculate what your final ABV on your beer is going to be. If you just throw in an unknown amount of rum, you're not really going to know where your final ABV actually landed. So good to measure it before you throw it into the tank. Okay, so we've got our last drips coming out of this thing now. So we've ended up with just under 500 mils. So I'm gonna guess that's more or less about 450 mils of the, uh, of the, you know, the cacao infused rum now. That's gonna go into the tank. But what we can do to just get a little bit more, squeeze a bit more flavor out of this stuff is kind of do a bit of a, a sparging. So we're gonna use just a little bit more rum, just tip it over the top, kind of like the same way you do on a mash day, uh, sorry, on a brewing day when you do a bit of sparging. Same thing with a little bit more rum over the top of this stuff, just to kind of get those last little bits of flavor out of it. We don't have to do this, but we figured why not? And if it uh, bumps up the ABV of our, uh, of our stout just a little bit more, then you know what, why not? All right, so let's leave it with that. We'll let those last little bits drip out of it. Yeah, so we're carrying a bit more flavor out of that now. Just getting a little bit more of a, uh, a chocolate boost into this thing. So that is probably gonna bump us up to just about 500 mils when we're done with it. Alrighty, so now we ended up reaching just about 500 mils after doing that little bit of sparging there. So I'm gonna keep these over here. I'm gonna recycle them and reuse them for something else. Might try and make, you know, uh, some other kind of Christmassy chocolate rum or something. I don't know, could be a holiday drink over there and that. Now, over here, uh, we are going to now do our dry hopping. So once again, if you don't have any of this stuff, you don't need it. Just drop this uh, you know, chocolatey goodness straight into your tank and Bob's your uncle. But if you do have something like this, go for it. So this is a dry hopping station. So what we're gonna do with this is take, first of all, close off this valve here. Whoops. Then we're gonna open this up. Pour our uh, chocolate infused rum into this and then, uh, you know, dry hop it. Let's grab this, pour it all in. Oh, I really want to taste this. Bummer. Not <laughs> right now. Oh, this is going to be so good. Just leave your tiny bit in the jar, mate. There we go. I'll clean up the jar later with my fingers. That's gonna Does be good. feel like making a chocolate cake. Eh? <laughs> it is a bit like making, it is a bit like, you know, being a pastry chef. Yeah. All right, now we're gonna close this back up here, close our clamps, and then we're just gonna purge this thing with a bit of carbon dioxide to make sure that it's uh, oxygen free before it goes into the tank. And that's the whole purpose behind this dry hopper here. It basically allows you to do zero oxygen dry hopping. So 
More important when you're working with really hoppy styles of beer, but you know, if we have the functionality to do this, then uh, you know, why not use it? All right, so now we open up the gas into here and we can just purge this with a bit of carbon dioxide. Might do it one more time, then we should be good to go. Alrighty, close that off. Now, chocolate away. There we go. All right guys, that's a wrap. Uh, so we've gone through the full process for our chocolate stout from grain milling through to mashing, through to sparging, hop additions, boiling, um, now fermentation and dry hopping with our cacao nibs. So we're gonna let this thing sit here for two more days. We're gonna cold crash it, then we're gonna keg it. Uh, and then after this, we're gonna do a tasting video where we actually give you our honest feedback on how this thing turned out. It is a brand new recipe, so fingers crossed that it's actually drinkable. And uh, as we said before, we are gonna release this recipe for you guys as well. So if you guys do end up brewing this chocolate stout, if there's anything you change with it, if there's any ways that you guys find to make it better or improve it, please let us know. We're all ears, we're always trying to make our beers better. So if you have any ideas about how to improve this process, please do drop a comment below, let us know. And uh, you know, until then, we'll catch you guys next time. Uh, as always, if you're feeling generous, give us a like, throw us a subscribe. It really does help us out. But uh, you know, cheers for sticking with us and uh, brew on.